Hi everybody, welcome to my YouTube channel Dr. Srinivas Medical Concepts and my FB page Dr. Srinivas Concepts. This is Dr. Srinivas, neurologist from Rajmandri, Andhra Pradesh, India. I am also the medical author of the book Focused Neurology. My email is 3klpm at gmail.com. Today we are going to talk about a very very fascinating topic, the pupillary light reflex. The pupillary light reflex cranial nerves part 21, ocular motor nerves part 7. The pupillary light reflex. The pupillary reflexes. The principal pupillary reflex responses assessed on examination are the light response and the near response that is the accommodation. So the light response when we throw light the pupil constricts that is known as pupillary light reflex. The second reflex which we test is the accommodation reflex where we ask them to see a near object. The visual blurring stimulates the accommodation reflex. Again the pupil constricts there is a rounding of the rounding and then the, there is a convergence. This is known as accommodation triad. So the normal pupil constricts promptly in response to light. Pupillary constriction also occurs as a part of near response along with the convergence and rounding up of the lens for efficient near vision. Normally, the light and near responses are of the same magnitude. The pupillary light reaction is mediated by the macula, optic nerve, chiasm and optic tract. But before reaching the lateral geniculate body, pupil afferents leave the optic tract to synapse in the pretectum. In addition to the decussation of the nasal hemiretinal pupillary afferents, extensive crossing occurs through the posterior commissure with pupillary afferents synapsing both ipsilaterally and contralaterally. Because of the decussation in the chiasm and the decussation in the posterior commissure, pupillary reflexes, pupillary fibers are extensively commingled and the reflex is bilateral, both direct and consensual that is crossed. So this could be better understood when we see this diagram. This is depicted very well in the diagram. So here we can see the the optic nerve, the pupillary fibers. They go ipsilaterally and some of the fibers cross to the contralateral side. So because of this decussation crossing and some fibers going ipsilaterally we have both direct reflex and consensual light reflex. And then the fibers travel in the optic tract and this is the lateral geniculate body. But before the lateral geniculate body, the fibers from the optic tract go to the pretectal nucleus and edinger westphal nucleus bilaterally again. So again it goes bilaterally, same side and opposite side. Because of this, they have direct light reflex and the indirect light reflex. Then it comes from the edinger westphal nucleus. It comes as short ciliary nerves and supplies the pupillary sphincter fibers. So pupillary afferent fibers from the right eye are crossed and uncrossed and run both and run in both optic tracts. They leave the tract before the lateral geniculate body and send projections to the pretectal region bilaterally. Again, it is responsible for both light, direct and indirect light reflex. The edinger westphal nucleus, it is here. It sends pupillomotor fibers through the cranial, through, through the third cranial nerve to the ciliary ganglion and postganglionic fibers innervate the pupillary sphincter. So, because of the bilaterally of, because of the bilaterality of the pathways, a uh, light stimulus in the right eye causes pupillary constriction in both eyes. What is, those, what is that bilaterality? One crossing at the chiasm, one going straight and one going to the opposite side. So crossing occurs at chiasm 1 and second crossing occurs at the level of posterior commissure where it goes to the pretectal nucleus on the same side as well as on the opposite side. Pretectal nucleus, edinger westphal nucleus on the same side as well as on the opposite side. So because of this bilaterality of the pathways, a light stimulus in the right eye causes pupillary constriction not only in the right eye but also in the left eye. So if, it's, if we understand this diagram, the pupillary light reflex can be understood very well. 
And another important point is that pupillary parasympathetic fibers run superficially on the third nerve. So any extrinsic compression of the third nerve will first affect the superficially placed parasympathetic fibers and therefore any extrinsic compression like peak aneurysm or herniation will affect the parasympathetic fibers which are superficially placed and since parasympathetic causes constriction of the pupils since they are affected, pupils are dilated. So pupils are the earliest to get affected in a, an extrinsic compression of the third nerve. If it is an intrinsic compression of the third nerve, the superficially parasympathetic fibers are spared and therefore the pupils are not affected even if it is affected, it is last to the affected. So an intrinsic palsy of the third nerve like diaptic third nerve palsy is sometimes known as pupillary sparing third nerve palsy. So fibers on the pretectum to the edinger westphal subnucleus of the oculomotor nucleus complex in the midbrain. Parasympathetic pupillary efferents from the edinger westphal subnucleus enter the third nerve and travels to the cavernous sinus along the inferior branch of the third nerve in the orbit to the ciliary ganglion then through the short posterior ciliary nerves to innervate the pupillary constrictor muscle of the iris. The balancing parasympathetic input from the edinger westphal subnucleus is the sympathetic input ascending from the superior cervical ganglion. So pupil size is controlled by two pathways. One the parasympathetic pathway which causes constriction of the pupil, sympathetic pathway which causes the dilatation of the pupil. Light stimulates the parasympathetic pathway and causes the constriction of the pupil. Darkness stimulates the sympathetic pathway and causes the dilatation of the pupil. So balancing the parasympathetic input from the edinger westphal subnucleus is the sympathetic input ascending from the superior cervical ganglion. The pupillary constrictor muscle is concentrically arranged whereas the pupillodilator muscle is radially arranged. So the light testing of the light reflex. The light reflex should be tested in each eye individually. The light reflex should be tested in each eye individually. The examining light should be shown into the eye obliquely with a patient fixing at a distance to avoid eliciting a confounding near response or accommodation response. The accommodation reflex is is brought into action when a person sees a near object. So when a person sees a, sees a distance at a distance and then suddenly focuses at near object, there is visual blurring. This visual blurring stimulates accommodation reflex and this also causes the triad. The convergence of the eyes, the rounding up of the lens and the uh, pupillary constriction. So this is accommodation reflex. The pathways for light reflex and the accommodation reflex are different. The pupillary light reflex pathway as we just noticed before the lateral geniculate body, it comes from the optic tract, goes to the pretector nucleus, edinger westphal nucleus and the pupillary constrictor fibers. Whereas the accommodation reflex does not go to the pretector nucleus, it goes to the directly to the edinger westphal nucleus and supplies the pupil. And therefore, if there is a lesion in the posterior commission or pretectum, it affects the light reflex pathway, but the accommodation reflex pathway which does not go to the pretectal is spared. So, if there is a lesion in the pretectal region, the classic example is neurosyphilis. It produces ARP, Argyll Robertson pupil. Easy to remember, Argyll Robertson pupil, ARP, also causes ARP, that is the accommodation reflex is present. So, when there is a lesion in the pretectal nucleus, the light reflex gets affected, but accommodation reflex is spared. So, the normal pupillary light reflex is brisk constriction followed by slight dilatation back to an intermediate state, the pupillary escape. Escape may occur because of the adaptation of the visual system to the level of the illumination. So, how do we test the light reflex? The examining light should be shown into each eye obliquely with the patient fixing at a distance to avoid a eliciting a confounding near response for the accommodation reflex. So these are all the important concepts of the pupillary light reflex. The other important neurology concepts I have put it in a question and answer format in a book Focus Neurology written by me Dr. S. Srinivas. This is available online from all leading booksellers including Amazon. If interested this book could be bought online. If you have enjoyed listening to my lecture on the pupillary light reflex which is very very important, uh, please like it and share the link with your friends. But please subscribe my YouTube channel. Dr. Srinivas Medical Concepts and my FB page Dr. Srinivas Concepts. Thank you. Bye.